When I was growing up, I wanted to be a superhero astronaut, and all of what I did as a kid was geared towards that dream. My name's Frank Eric Simmeranzel, and I am the president and founder of Appreciating Circles. One of the first major obstacles that I experienced was growing up and being bullied all the time. Jumped by multiple kids, several times I got sucker punched. Those experiences ultimately led me to leadership development in all of its forms from wilderness survival training, wrestling all four years through school, competing in karate, and I ended up working very closely with the military as a civilian subject matter expert. Looking back at my entire journey, this idea of becoming a superhero was always inside of me, will always be inside of me. It's slightly shifted from working with the military to working with entrepreneurs. It's created an invincible mindset. It's allowed me to hone and refine the skill of high ticket sales and influence and to train other leaders and to train other teams to be able to do the same. I help entrepreneurs optimize the four major areas of their lives, their mind, their sales, their fitness, and their time. And what that all allows you to do is to be the leader you've always wanted to be. To not only step into your power, but to allow those you lead and love to step into theirs. It's here, it's yours for the taking. And so thank you so very much, and I'm looking forward to what the next holds for the both of us. I love you, I appreciate you. Okay, hello, we've got Frank Simmeran. How do we say your name? <laughs> so <laughs> Frank Eric Simmerhansel is such a challenging name to spell. I actually own the domain, howtosaymyname.com, and it just forwards to an MP3 of me singing Frank Eric Simmerhansel. Frank Eric Simmerhansel. There we go. Yeah. So this is there you go. So this fine born leader within you. Everyone knows the style. If you don't know the style, we interview a leader in any different industry, someone who's really just creating heat waves, you know, doing amazing things around the world, you know, changing people's lives, you know, someone who, you know, does, makes an impact in such a big way. And for me, and for Find a Born Leader Within You, it's always about finding out the backstory rather than just the, the income. It's much more than that. It's like, um, so basically, you know, it's about finding out about what makes them who they are, you know. So it's my pleasure to actually introduce Frank Eric Simaranzo, as you heard from already. This is Uncut and Live. That basically, you know, it's always good to get people's names right, man. You know, it's like just not say someone's name and not get it right. So here we got Frank Eric Simaranzo. And the way it works, Frank, um, if you don't already know and if you haven't already seen how the interviews are, I will be asking you, you know, basically what do you do before you go to bed, before you close your eyes, you know, if you have a routine or you don't have a routine, then after that we'll be asking you basically, you know, what do you do in the morning before you open your eyes and do you have a routine in the morning or what do you have for breakfast? And then we go way back to your childhood as far as you can remember and then we just move into the bit where we just go straight, um, you know, build up the build up moment where we find out exactly what makes you who you are and that's when you can share your story and what you represent and what you're about. You ready? Let's do it. Let's dive in. Okay. So first things first, what do you do when you wake up in the evening? When you wake up in the evening, when you, before you go to <laughs> bed in the evening, <laughs> it's good to laugh. So right, right before bed is uh, power down all electronics for quite a while. Um, so blue light filters are pretty much on all day long. Just to help me sleep quite a bit better. Uh, but right before sleep, I'll usually write down um, something in my appreciation journal. So I've got journals for manifestation and appreciation, and they're basically the same type of journal. And so I'll just hand write down, like, what was it when I woke up this morning that I was looking to create, either for myself, for my life, for others, and then uh, just appreciating, well, what was created, whether that was a conscious creation or whether that was something that was a total surprise, and then I drift off to sleep. Um, sometimes I'll drift off with uh, either guided meditations or um, audios that I've had myself. Um, sometimes I'll have little 30 second to 60 second clips that are just looped over and over again of a scenario that's in the mind that I'm consciously choosing to create. And sometimes I'll just have total silence right as I drift off. Wow, that's pretty cool. Wow. So you listen to recordings in the loop. Okay, so if you didn't hear that, definitely replay that when you're watching, if you're watching on the replay. Take notes while you're joining us now. Watch, um, you know, listening to Frank on what he actually, what actually he does before he goes to bed because it's quite powerful. And what you take on board, what you listen to before you wake up in the morning, what you take in. And I like the fact you say you just switch off from everything and you just like zone out, go into meditation and all that trance, that stuff. That's very powerful. Thank you for sharing. Uh, much appreciated. So, what happens when you wake up in the morning before you open your eyes? 
Super simple. Um, it's actually, it's RPM. So rise, pee, meditate. So I'll just run to the bathroom because I drink a lot of water throughout the day. So that's usually the first thing that happens. And then I'll immediately either come back to bed or I'll grab a cushion or a pillow and just go into a seated position and just sit and do nothing. So um, when people first meditate, uh, they think that meditation is an activity. It's like something that you do and it's something that you turn on for maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour or two hours or a 10 day Vipassana retreat. And as you progress over the years with meditation, um, especially once you're in like year one, year two, year 10 and beyond, you discover that meditation is, it's actually the background of who we are. This awareness, watching awareness that's ever present to everything. So I tap into that awareness, understand that We'll relax back into the awareness that's watching the awareness, that's observing awareness itself, and then coming forward into that awareness that's aware of all the senses. And then there's just appreciation for this day, for being able to breathe. And then we come alive. Powerful, powerful, powerful. You know, one thing I didn't hear you say is anything to do with eating. You don't, do you do, what do you do? Do you eat or no eating at the moment? Sometimes. Um, so I do a lot of, I've done a lot of 24 to 72 hour water fasts over the years. And so food, is, it's really fascinating. My whole relationship with food changed um, back in 2016 when I did my first uh, multi-day water fast. And after that, I, I don't really feel that hunger um, is something that controls the body. So a lot of times I'll go through the day and if I feel really hungry, then I'll eat a big meal in the morning. Um, sometimes something really heavy, uh, protein rich. And then if I need something to like fuel the body at night, then I'll eat a super giant meal and have a lot of carbs at night. And then lunch is sometimes kind of, you know, maybe there, maybe not. Um, but more often than not, I'm doing like an 18 to 24 hour water fast and just have like a one to six hour sort of eating window, feeding window. And then some days I'll just go all out and just eat everything under the sun and uh, basically treat life like a buffet and gorge myself as best I can. And I find that that kind of natural rhythm of not really allowing the stomach to have the same type of uh, the exact same timing of eating every single day is something that I've just really, really come to love. This sort of uh, programmed randomness, this controlled chaos, so to speak, with eating. And so sometimes in the morning, it's lots of food. Sometimes in the morning, it's no food. Um, yeah, just kind of depends on what the day calls for. And I love that my relationship with food is such that if I don't need to eat for a couple of days and I'm just there to drink water, like whatever the activity is, whatever the project is, that I can just push and burn right through. And then once I need that refuel, that rest, that recharge, then I'll just drop into the body's natural energy cycles, do that, refuel, and then good to go again. That's powerful. You know, that's a lot of um, will. And then, um, well, do you know what? That takes a lot to do that, man. A lot to do that. A lot of mind control to be able to like to be able to resist not eating. But I take it you've been doing this for some time, so it becomes easy. When you first started, was it as easy as you're making out? To no, 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 not at all. Wow. Um, yeah, when I when I first started, like the I remember I remember distinctly my first three day water fast. And it, I was kind of silly about it because I did it during um, a whole bunch of high ticket sales calls. Uh, I was working with a finance firm at the time, doing some consulting for them. And I was still salesman of the month that month, still put a whole bunch of deals on the board that week. But it was just like this feeling of like your whole, because when, when you get like 36 hours into a water fast, your body drops into this natural state of ketosis. Now, keto is kind of like a, a kind of a fancy fad word now where people yeah. take either different shakes or different powders or different things. But once your body, your body holds somewhere between 100 to 200 grams um, of glycogen, uh, you know, when you eat carbohydrates normally, it kind of converts into that and stores in the muscles. So once that's depleted, um, and it normally takes somewhere around 24 to 36 hours um, and, it, you know, maybe a little bit of walking, sprinting, kettlebell swings, just something to get the body moving. But once that's depleted, your mind, like your brain just lights on fire in a really positive, really powerful way. Where sometimes when you're you're taking like supplements, um, like I've been off caffeine now for several weeks now, just resetting the body's relationship with caffeine. But normally when I drink caffeine, it's almost like you're you're burning a log. It's like you're burning something, but there's almost like an ashy energy left behind. It's like you can you kind of feel that crash. But when you have that energy, uh, that energizing like mind on fire with a 36 hour water fast, especially as you're cruising into that 48 to 72 hour window, 
it's like burning pure oxygen. It's a really, really clean burn. It's a really, really clean fuel. And then when I refuel the body, you know, the body just kind of naturally dips back down. But I notice that I've always got that available to me anytime. Wow, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Every time I do these interviews, and I, I've lost count of how many interviews I've done for Find a Ball Needle Within You, everyone's routine is so different. What they do is just different. There's so many different variations of things. Like, it's, wow. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to go way back. As far as you can remember your, your childhood and what you feel comfortable to share with us, please just go back to there and let us know what, um, what's the difference from who you are now, not going too much detail on who you are now, but your childhood what was it like for you as a child growing up who was your role did you have any role models did you see anyone that you looked up to you know was there a difference in who you are then from now yeah i was really 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 fortunate um growing up in houston texas where i had just tribes of masculine mentors that really helped to raise me. Um, I was in just about every sport that you can imagine from uh, little league to soccer, to competing in karate, to football, to ROTC, um, to boy scouts and earning my Eagle scout and then turning around and becoming a scout master myself later on um, to, to just about everything that you could really think of. Um, wrestling did that for all four years, uh, learned from some wonderful chess masters, uh, first in Houston. And, uh, then before I'd graduated from high school, I was the president of the chess club. So I, I was always around these amazing men and it just really helped solidify these, like so many different types of people and so many different types of lifestyles because I could hang out with a retired military officer one day, and then I'd be hanging out with a master electrician another day, and then I'd be hanging out with somebody who uh, maybe got their doctorate in mathematics and then just decided to be a calculus teacher um, the next day, you know, and, and all these different coaches, all these different mentors, um, just, you know, how the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And I really, really had that. So it wasn't just my parents doing such a phenomenal job um, as best they could, you know, all the, all the years that um, I was raised by them, but it was really just so many different um, tribes of Texans, I guess I'll put it best. Um, that's where I'm from uh, that really helped develop me into who I am today. So I'm very, very grateful, very fortunate that I had those mentors. I have to touch that video, that video that we've been, because I did a lot of um, pushing that video out there and it's had a lot of views and that sucker punch that you got from school day, how did that come about? That, was that, did that actually happen? <laughs> I know we get <laughs> Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, I was the only Caucasian uh, in most of the schools that I would go to. So elementary school, it was mostly African-American. Um, middle school, it was kind of a mix. Uh, high school, it was mostly Hispanic. And so in most of my classes, um, I was the only white person uh, that was in there. And so there was a lot of um, just, I mean, it is what it is, uh, a lot of profiling just based on the color of my skin and uh, me being very small, being very uh, weak for many, many years and just not really having a sense of, well, you know, how do, how do you, how do you win friends and influence people as Dale Carnegie wrote? Um, how do you actually form a group of friends around you? Cause even though I was doing so many great things with adults that other kids around me just, you know, didn't really like me for whatever reason. I was never one of the cool kids. Um, I was never one of the ones that, you know, people would want to pick first in sports, even though I was playing all the different sports. And so it was just a, a lot of constant uh, physical assault. Uh, very, very fortunately, very fortunately, no sexual assault or anything like that when I was younger. Um, but yeah, dozens and dozens and dozens of times um, getting beat up by uh, groups of kids or one kid at a time and just a lot of fighting. Uh, and it wasn't really until um, I started progressing into my wrestling career, into my grappling career, that I finally developed this physical confidence to say, oh, cool. This is what it is when somebody grabs you. This is how you actually avoid a punch and uh, prevent somebody from taking you down so you don't get tackled. Or this is how to actually spot when four kids are standing around and they're getting real suspicious right about now. And now that um, that sort of uh, almost like an alert that would kind of go off in the brain has relaxed into this really deep awareness of just my surroundings and just having fun in reality because now everywhere I go is the safest place that I could possibly be because I'm there and I don't really get that kind of alert trigger anymore. Um, I can normally avoid situations from a hundred yards away, literally, and just kind of see, Oh, I, I know what's about to happen there. I've seen that, seen that pattern before and uh, just avoid situations. Wow, wow. So when you say avoid, did you not 
use your techniques to cause some damage on people that or did you was you peaceful yeah honestly no, no, be, uh, be all, honest all as a kid um i i didn't start any fights and i didn't win nearly all of them okay. no it was uh it was a lot of beat downs but it teaches you a lot yeah yeah, definitely, def uh, I totally agree with you. So um, moving on from school days, did you go, where did you go? Did you go college, university? Did you yeah, have any very, role models uh, onwards? Yeah, I was, uh, I was very fortunate to go to Texas A&M University. That was only 90 minutes from my front door in Houston. And it was, again, just tribes of masculine role models and leaders. Um, I was in the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. Um, I was a national champion rifle drillman with the Fighting Texas Aggie Fish Drill Team. Um, actually, they're, they're national champions every year. So that's kind of sort of uh, their thing that they always win against uh, every other service academy. And anyone who joins them just gets to uh, earn that title as well. But a lot of long days, a lot of unpleasant nights, and a lot of sore muscles. Um, and all four years going through that program, I uh, got to hang around even more military officers. And what a lot of people don't recognize about Texas A&M is it's one of the few schools, um, one of the most popular schools in the nation for training U.S. military officers. But around two thirds of the people that go through that program don't actually commission. Uh, we all become civilian leaders. I became a fitness professional. Several of my friends became lawyers. Um, other friends became doctors. Other friends went on to just go lead in the corporate sector. Um, others become entrepreneurs and come back years later. And so it's only about somewhere between a quarter to a third of people that go through that whole four-year program, like I did, actually commission. Um, and the rest of us never become veterans. We just are happy to help train this next generation of leaders. Powerful, powerful. You're very humble as well with everything you've accomplished, man. I find you very humble and peaceful and just, you know, at one with yourself, which is very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. It's um, something that a lot of people could really do, um, appreciate and, and, and actually really develop in their, in their life and, you know, implementing what they do, you know, because a lot of people go around very really angry of life, you know, despite the fact of what happened with you in your childhood, you haven't gone around and cause any injuries of anyone from what you've said you know you've just been you know very peacefully just dealing with things in a much more calmer and uh, you know an understanding kind of way you know yeah knowing that you it, it also it also helps a lot living in san diego because we have access to world-class mixed martial arts academies so anytime there is some of that physical aggression that kind of comes up and there's a very, very healthy way to take that out in a kickboxing class or jujitsu class, um, or to just go wrestle uh, on an open mat or a Saturday or a Sunday. And when you, you have those live engagements in a very safe environment, you're surrounded by black belts, you're surrounded by people who can referee. Um, there, there's a lot of consent uh, with that, uh, again, controlled chaos. Um, there's no need for violence because you have so much fun fighting. There's no need to take it outside of a gym ever because you're enjoying all of your time inside of the academy. Okay, okay. So moving on, um, did you serve in Minich? Um, in the, um, Minich? No, you didn't? I did not. Did no, so I was a fitness professional, um, essentially what's called a subject matter expert. Uh, so in way back in the day, um, there was this totally unknown fitness program called CrossFit. And I was the first person to bring a kettlebell that nobody had heard of at the time onto the quad at Texas A&M and then introduced people to kettlebells, to CrossFit. Um, I ended up getting trained individually in Olympic weightlifting, did that for a few semesters, um, then in powerlifting, then in gymnastics. And so I was able to pull all these kind of skills together. So by the time I was a junior and senior, uh, what I was actually helping a lot of officer candidates do was to be able to go into their respective officer candidate schools or to commission as either ensigns or second lieutenants um, in whatever branch that they were. Um, and just help them prevent injury, um, help them pass uh, and really thrive in their physical tests and really help develop programs that they could then take to their soldiers or sailors, airmen, marine guardsmen, um, whatever branch that they were going into. Okay. Because I kind of, like, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the viewers, people watching live and the ones watching on the replay would think that if you're, if you're giving advice to someone in like, whether it's the military or driving, that you have to have participated in it actually served in it to be able to give them advice on how they deal with a situation if you can understand where i'm coming from uh, what would you be your angle on that has anyone ever said that to you or do you, do you understand do you understand it or do you feel that's not necessary um no not, not even necessary um i just say when it comes to everything in the military um you know when it, when it comes to 
uh, let's say war fighting strategies or combat tactics, like that's y'all's domain. Um, I don't have any understanding of that world. What I do have an understanding of is how you can squat more effectively, deadlift better, um, practice swings, cleans, jerks, snatches, um, you know, handstands, push-ups, these different types of movements so that your body is the, the best that it can be athletically so that when you show up on the battlefield um, that you're far more likely not only to survive, but to lead your men and women um, to surviving as well as best we can. You know, knowing obviously there's no guarantees um, in anything. Uh, we're just here to, to really align people's bodies as best we can. And sometimes it's a lot simpler than um, people think it has to be. Like one of the things I loved about kettlebells back in the day is all you really needed was maybe swings and get-ups um, where you're laying down on the ground and standing up or just super basic push-ups and pull-ups, super basic um, squats and handstand push-ups. Uh, super basic dips and then kettlebell snatches. So these really simple, like two to three movements that we could have people do where they didn't have to go crazy. They didn't have to burn themselves out. Um, we were never pushing anybody to the point of injury. We wanted them to be able to train effectively and always be able to go 100%. So we would very rarely push them 100% in training. Uh, we would push them a lot to like 60 to 80% in training, but do that very, very, very consistently. So we knew that if we were at 60 to 80% in the physical training, they would still have enough energy to do all of their actual military training. Powerful. You know, and um, you saying that, actually, I was just watching a video and seeing clips of you, you are like in your top peak performance, like levels of performance that you, with the stuff that you're capable of doing is like, like almost superhuman from the stuff, you know, like, how do you train yourself to get to that level? What, what kind of advice could you give the viewers or the people on the replay to get to what, what does it take to be that, to get there? I want to know. I want to be, I want to be like, I'd be doing those moves. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you. Um, so I, I was very, very fortunate that the very first person I learned any kind of physical fitness from was a man named Pavel Satsulin. And he is one of the men who's responsible for kettlebells coming over to the United States. And his whole philosophy of training is one that I've adopted uh, for a long time of, and it's the total opposite of most fitness ideologies that are out there right now, um, including CrossFit, which is a very intelligent ideology in its own way. But Pavel's whole thing was never train to failure, but train very consistently. Don't train as if you're training for one peak performance, train as if you're going to be able to do this for five years, 10 years, 20 years and beyond. So all of my training, even when, um, say, I'm doing a, a rack pull squats or deadlifts um, in the 495 to 675 pound range, um, which I, I forget how many kilos that is, but it's a whole bunch of kilos. Um, but even when I'm moving very, very heavy weights, yeah. what I notice is I, I never, ever want to push to failure in anything. So I always keep uh, what we call a rep or two in the tank. And sometimes we'll even keep a set or two in the tank. So it's far better, far better, far better for life to be able to go consistently at 80% than it is to attempt to push yourself and really max out at that 100%. It's good for the mind. Like it's really, really good if, if you haven't um, done a lot of athletic training uh, to be able to, to see just where your body can go. But that 80% and not really going too far beyond that, like maybe 85, maybe 90, um, unless you're in some type of competition, uh, such as, uh, um, well, I mean, any type of competition, but outside of a, a competitive environment where you know you're going to compete in a peak performance way, um, it's way better to just be very, very consistent and to just gradually dial things back and to um, increase things a little bit slower than you think you need to. Um, and I'll give you a, a real world example. So let's say that you want to add um, 50 kilograms to your squat over the next year. Well, what a lot of programs will teach you to do is, and they'll sell you in internet marketing on this, is they'll say, hey, here's how to add 50 kilos to your squat in a month or in three months, where it's actually way better for the most part, for most people. Now, there's, there's exceptions if you have athletic goals um, that are beyond this, but for the vast majority of human beings, it's better to take a year and just see, hey, let's add five kilograms a month, but let's hold consistently that same weight for a month. 
and it seems really slow and it seems like you're not really progressing as fast as you could be, but you'll find that your body just loves that over time. Your, your bones will strengthen more, your tendons, your sinews, you know, these kind of things that um, help put, pull the body together uh, just beyond the muscles that they'll get a lot stronger over time and you'll have no risk of tearing, no risk of injury because athletically I didn't always follow that. And so I have like a tear in my right shoulder. Um, I've torn this biceps doing Texas strongman training. Um, I've torn my elbow uh, doing extra pull-up training. Um, I've ripped my knee twice doing jujitsu competitions and preparing for them. Um, I've broken my back for a year doing uh, more Texas strongman training with these big Atlas stones where you're leaning back and putting them up on the platform. So I've gone through this progression of, well, when you push the body really, really, really hard, there's risk to that. And the rewards don't always outweigh the risks. So that's what I tell most people to do is find, find your 80% and just stay there really, really, really consistently and progress really slowly over longer periods of time than is comfortable for you too. Because it's, it's almost like, you know, you have that comfort zone that you stay in and you don't want to stay in that comfort zone. And so we normally get to that place where it's uncomfortable, but sometimes progressing very slowly can be uncomfortable. Um, and I only say that with the body because with the mind, like with your finances, with business, um, you know, emotional clearing, there's a lot of different things in life where you can progress very rapidly, very, very rapidly. But with the body, I tell people progress really slowly because you only got one and you're going to keep it for life. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that advice. Progress really slowly because you've only got one. <laughs> That's so true. So moving on, man. Moving on from there. You've you've served in the you've well, you've, you've you've served for the military in a sense, but you haven't served time. Civilian, in yes. To, in the, as a civilian, but at the same yes. time, you've um you've done amazing stuff, man. You've helped a lot of people. You've probably, you've most likely definitely saved lives by the skills and stuff that you've taught. You know you know, uh, um, the military. I mean, when you say the military, do you see America or U.S. military, just U.S. military alone, yeah? Just uh, U.S. military, yes. U.S. military, that's, that's big enough as it is, man. That's, that's a serious responsibility as well to be in that kind of position, in that position full stop. So how does that move you into where you, because from, from there, is that, you, is that, what age was you in, in the military, um, serving in the military and helping and training? What age, what age range was that? So it was at Texas A&M from the age of 18 until I was 18? 22. 18 to 22. Okay, yeah. okay. So what was the next step after that, moving on from there? Well, where, where did you go from there? I um, became a fitness professional. It was the most logical course right after that. Um, okay. I wrote a training manual that I get, ended up giving to uh, my training squadron, what was called an outfit at the time. Um, so I'd basically written a book on fitness, even though it was uh, a manual for the outfit, like I didn't claim authorship of it. Um, there was something to that. And I was like, oh, people can make money, like real money, showing other people how to just lift things and move their bodies. Oh, cool. Um, so I ended up doing that for a number of years. And then in the year 2012, uh, I, I kind of looked up and I was like, I don't know how to sell anything. Like how to take an idea, generate leads, turn that into money, turn that into a system, and then repeat the whole process. Had no understanding of that. Um, so that's what got me into high ticket consulting in 2012. Worked in a few different industries um, in the construction niche for a little bit. And then after, <laughs> after a day where we were literally chasing 12 tornadoes in Texas on the same day and actually chasing these tornadoes down to find like these construction projects because there was going to be some damage to them. I was like, mm, I don't think this is the right move for me. I, th I think I'm going to get out of this one. Um, so I ended up going into uh, the car sales for a while and uh, I love selling Hondas. So I'd driven like three Honda Accords at the time. Um, and it was just a vehicle that I knew that I loved and I did really, really, really well at that. And I did so well that I got headhunted um, in 2014 to be a digital marketing consultant. So they were like, dude, if you can sell these 30 grand to 60 grand cars and you know, you're salesman of the month and you're a sales manager and you can lead all these teams and do all these corporate trainings, um, can you sell a $10,000 webinar consulting package? I was like, sure, seems like a small deal to me. And so I designed some training um, around that, came into a team, became salesman of the month, got to work with a lot of really cool people and started doing my own private consulting uh, until around 2015. And then 2015 rocked my world on Christmas day when my mom had a heart attack very suddenly. And for, for anybody who's watching, Christmas day is actually the best time to very suddenly lose a parent 
because she was surrounded by loved ones, not at work. Um, I had had a, an awesome one-on-one -on -one conversation with her uh, right before the heart attack where we had no signs. Like it was just sudden instant gone. Um, everybody had taken off of work, you know, so everybody was already in that space to, uh, to be able to help out with the afterlife affairs. And uh, over the next year, it was such, such, such a challenging time. And again, best case scenario for it to happen on that day. And you always want to be the one to lose your parents because I've had family members who have lost their children and it devastates them for life. Um, so I was just very, very fortunate. And so for the next year, um, I ended up doing financial consulting uh, with a firm where I just said, I don't want to do anything business wise. All I want to do is show up. You're going to hand me leads. I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to be salesman of the month. And so I walked into salesman of the month and all I would do for the entire year was go make sales, go drink beer, go fight jujitsu and go be with my girlfriend at the time. And that was it. That was my whole life for a year. And then 2017 came out of that grief, came out of that depression um, and then started doing my own consulting again, started working with a number of different teams. And a lot of those video testimonials um, that you see started coming from 2017, 2018 and beyond to now in 2020, where I just have a lot of fun helping a lot of people make more money and help even more people. Wow, phenomenal guest, man! You've you've done so much, man, and 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 the whole time through the whole interview, you've just been very just one level, like you've even gone up or changed <laughs> any kind of state. You've just been the same state occasionally that like you've changed state now and again. But yeah. the stuff that you've achieved, and you know, I, and some of the stuff I didn't even know. I've done, I did look into it. I know your website; you're in the um, process of getting that sorted all out, and you know, yeah. re, you know, rebranding and everything. Wow, wow. Wow, if any of you want to ask a question, do feel free while it's live. Live is always the best time to ask a question rather than when it's on a replay. So if you want to ask, you know, Frank, how has he been able to achieve certain things that he's been able to achieve, be free yeah. to ask away, you know? Because, um, wow, you know, like just with what you're saying and the stuff that you've done, and, um, you know, some people wish and dream that they could do it, but they never have the dream that big enough to actually achieve the stuff that you've achieved. You know, some people... They've been in a, on, in a business, whether it's online network marketing or affiliate marketing, any kind of business, they like, struggle to make money. You know, they start a business, maybe they might continue on for about six months. By a year, they're, they're out, they're out and dust and they're just back to their nine to five, you know, or they, or they it could be worse than that, you know. And there's yeah. people that's in that online marketing that don't even know how to have a conversation with someone, you know. And this, the, 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 I recommend the, all of them go into sales, go into sales, go into sales, go into sales. Find a niche that aligns with your heart, like that the matches your integrity and, and who you want to be in the world and just go sell something cool. You'll learn so much. You know, and it's not even intentional to be getting people to sell sales, but once you're just in line with that kind of alignment, it's like you just start to attract it. And like the level of energy that you bring and what you're capable of. I want, I want everyone to know that this guy, this, um, this like meditation with your eyes open, ex I experienced that when I first reached out. <laughs> he was like, it wasn't even about finding out how we're going to do the interview. It was, it was just like, he wanted to show me exactly what he's about. Meditation with your eyes open is powerful. I'm telling you to reach out to Frank, you know, reach out to him, find out more about him, connect with him on Facebook. You know, he will share with you everywhere that you can connect with him. But this guy is phenomenal. This is the reason why I made sure that I got him as a guest. And it's, it's something that, I really wanted to have happened sooner, but you know, sometimes you just, it's best not to rush things, but there's no, I wouldn't say there's a, there's a right time or a wrong time. There's a now time and being the now is what I would say. But the whole experience was just so real. When you actually go on these actual lit website, I'm not sure what the actual website link it would share with that with you. I was watching back my replay of my feedback on my experience and it was just like, wow, <laughs> it is amazing that, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that just, not aware of certain people like yourself you know and this is the reason why i like to give you my um, platform you know collaborate and share my audience with you and you know just blast it out and let people know who you are and what you represent you know if, what, what would you say has been your like longest um and thank you for leaving a the link there i see it there radiant presence wow. what would you say was being your biggest achievement um you know, biggest achievement you've actually done and what are you looking to do in the near future or in, or, or, or all a lifetime goal? So my, my biggest achievement, I would say to date, um, is actually working with the Greatness Collective, um, where we go down to Mexico and we build houses for the working poor. And I started joining their project in 2018 um, according to their founder, Mike Shcherbakov, amazing man himself, um, I still hold the record for the fastest sign up. So I saw him speak 
And he said, hey, we're going down to Mexico to build these houses and they're sleeping on dirt floors and they have pallets for walls and they have tarps for roofs and they do not name their children until they're a year old because the infant mortality rate is so high that they don't want to get emotionally and spiritually attached to their child. And um, I showed him my receipt like right as he was getting off stage. I was like, all right, here we go. I'm signing up. Um, And the reason why that was one of the greatest achievements is it was the first time in my life that I broke down crying in front of 60 brand new friends, actually about 50 brand new friends. I knew about 10 people there already. And there was no shame of it whatsoever. So growing up, there was a lot of, especially in Texas, uh, a lot of machismo culture, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, traditional masculinity, so to speak, not toxic masculinity, not in any way, shape or form, Um, but a lot of, you know, hold your emotions in, you don't show weakness. Um, And of course, with all the physical bullying that kind of coupled on top of it, And there was the first time that I could break down in front of all these people and watch other men, and of course other women too, break down crying as this family was opening the house to their new door that was nothing on